Well, here we are. Uh, hello, everyone from St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. My name is Janet Heron, and I am an alumni engagement officer at Memorial and your host for today's event. I hope you are all well and safe as we live through and move forward through these very strange days. I'm here with Dr. Jillian Gould for the third in our HSS 101 series. Our focus today is on the discipline of folklore. We will begin today's event with a land acknowledgement. And just there we go. One second. We respectfully acknowledge the territory in which Memorial St. John's campus is situated as the ancestral homelands of the Beotic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beotic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatuhavut and the Innu of Nitasinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all of the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. Please also recognize the peoples and their ancestors whose ancestral homelands are those on which your own institutions are situated. Okay. Now, just gonna pop that up there just quickly. Um, a few words first, a few housekeeping and a few introductory comments. Um, at the Office of Alumni Engagement, we are focused on connecting you, our alumni and friends, with Memorial and to create opportunities for you to celebrate, socialize, mentor, learn and advance both your career and improve your life. Embarking on new and exciting ways to build relationships is vital to Memorial's evolution as an institution. Our alumni and friends are our greatest ambassadors. You are a worldwide community of professionals, leaders, and change makers, advancing the reputation of our university, our province, and our world. Please consider getting involved with our programming. There are mentoring opportunities with 10,000 coffees, occasions to meet up with NL expats through Global NL, and Coastlines, our online memorial book club, features Newfoundland and Labrador authors who are also memorial alumni. You can find more details about all these initiatives on our website, www.mon.ca slash alumni. Thank you for joining our event today. HSS 101 is designed to introduce memorial alumni and friends, whether they work in business, science, economics, or anything in between, to disciplines in the social sciences and humanities that offer insight on the evolution of human knowledge, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. I'm gonna be monitoring the Q&A function that you see on your screen. If you'd like to ask a question, please type it in there. Um, I will try to check both the Q&A and the chat function, but ideally, please try to use the Q&A. Um, and Dr. Gould will answer as many questions as possible following her presentation. Um, if you're new to WebEx, there's a layout button on the top right hand of your screen, and there are options there for how you'd like to view today's presentation. So you can play around with that a bit if you need to. Uh, please note that this session is being recorded and uh, you will receive a link in an email, follow up email um, a couple of days after this event. Now, it is my very great pleasure to introduce our guest today. Let me take a sip of my water. Uh, Dr. Jillian Gould has loved folklore since before she even knew there was a name for it. She has always been interested in people learning their stories, customs, and traditions. She has been known to strike up conversations wherever she goes, at the grocery store, at the park, at the coffee shop. I can testify she can really knows how to strike up a conversation at the St. John's Farmer's Market as well. 
In her spare time, she loves to bake recipes her mother and grandmother made, Mandelbrot and poppy seed cookies and honey cakes, as well as new recipes she discovers in her many cookbooks. As a folklore professor, she takes great joy in introducing students to folklore, fieldwork, and ethnography. Over the years, she has enjoyed researching and writing about intersections of food, place, and identity on topics ranging from New York City candy stores and egg creams to the blueberry buns found in Toronto's Jewish bakeries to fish and chip shops in St. John's, as well as everyday kitchen food like the hole in the middles that she has eaten and then prepared hundreds, if not thousands of times. Hopefully she'll tell us what those are. Dr. Gould studied Jewish history and literature at the University of Toronto and received her master's in performance studies from New York University. She is also a very proud alumnus of Memorial, having completed her PhD in folklore in 2009. So now, uh, with no further ado, I'd like to pass over to Dr. Gillian Gould, who will present on her on folklore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, thank you to everyone for being here and to Janet for inviting me to give this talk. I love folklore and any opportunity to share a little bit about this discipline is a pleasure. So today I'll speak about folklore as an academic discipline, the work and research of folklorists and how an understanding of folklore helps us to see our everyday worlds a little bit differently. But first, I want to begin with a short history regarding the folklore department at Memorial, its founding and early years, who we are today, and how we imagine ourselves moving forward. Memorial's folklore department was founded in 1968 by the late Herbert Halpert, You'll see him here uh, in this portrait by Gerald Squires that looms large in the graduate seminar room of the department. Halpert was born in 1911, a New York Jew who moved here in the 60s and found his home in this province. When Halpert arrived, he was already mid-career and had accomplished so much. His vision and experiences shaped the department and many of those values continue to inform how we do things today. Halpert's understanding of folklore was shaped by many events and circumstances, including his formal schooling, but his folklore practice was shaped by his early work with the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, part of the United States New Deal programs that came up in the 1930s during the Great Depression. At that time, the US government hired artists and folklorists to document the music, speech, and artistic efforts of ordinary Americans. Halpert had several WPA projects under his belt. His professional experience included many cultural documentation and fieldwork projects of which the framework became the foundation of Memorial University's Folklore and Language Archive, perhaps better known by its acronym MUNFLA, and subsequently Memorial's Folklore Department. The Folklore Department and MUNFLA were part of the same vision. While in the United States, Halpert is remembered as a prominent WPA-era folklorist, his projects include a significant collection of New York City folklore, making him one of the earliest collectors of urban folklore, as well as his Southern States collection, which is one of the greatest in terms of breadth and depth of Southern folklore of the 1930s. In Canada, Halpert is best known, not only as the founder of Munfla and the Folklore Department, but also, along with his colleague, John Widdowson, Halpert was one of the great collectors of traditional folktales of this province. Halpert and Widdowson's 1996 two-volume collection, Folktales of Newfoundland, was declared by folklorist Bill Nicolaisen to be, this is a quote, 
the best edition of a regional or national for that matter, corpus of folk narrative that I have come across in almost 50 years of involvement in this field of study. The collection is available to view through the Digital Archives Initiative, the DAI, and also the original tapes and transcripts can be found at Munfla. So please take this as an invitation when it's safe again and you're in town to visit Munfla and to listen to tapes of traditional stories and narratives and jokes and occupational folklore. Munfla operates within the folklore department and has ensured that locally situated academic research conducted by faculty and students is made available to the public. As such, the archive helps to cement the relationship between the public and Memorial's folklore department. It's been over 50 years since Halpert founded the department, but his vision to emphasize fieldwork training continues today. About the department, you may or may not know that we are the only English language degree granting folklore program in Canada. Students can earn a BA, MA, or PhD in folklore. Our graduate students come from all over the world. In the past few years, we've admitted students from various parts of Canada and the US and Mexico, along with students from Bangladesh, China, Ukraine, the UK, Finland, Israel, Iran, to name a few. Our MA program has three unique streams. Students can complete comprehensive exams, write an MA thesis, or enroll in the public folklore stream for which students complete two cooperative work terms in folklore related job placements, including the Heritage Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador, the City Archives, the Association of Newfoundland and Labrador Archives, Them Days Magazine and Archives in Labrador, as well as various nonprofit organizations and community museums. I bring up the public folklore stream because it highlights that folklore is not only an academic discipline, but there is practical training as well. To go through the program in any stream, students begin by learning the skills and techniques of folklore fieldwork, also known as cultural documentation. In fact, since 2012, all incoming graduate students have been required to participate in in a three week intensive field school course. It is the very first course they take, and as such, it places field work front and center of an education in folklore. The field school covers a variety of topics that provide students with a basic introduction to cultural documentation in the field, including research ethics, project planning, public relations, interviewing documentary photography, sound recording, writing field notes, archiving, and delivering public presentations on research findings. At the heart of folklore research is identifying and documenting traditional expressive culture, the everyday customs that are not official or institutional and change from community to community, family to family, from individual to individual. One of the things I like best about being a folklorist is that it shifts the way I see the world. How are people interacting? What is the culture? Dynamics? What are the patterns? Folklore fieldwork combines people watching and deep listening with intention and purpose. We are known for training people how to interview to talk to people, to be curious, to listen. It's what we do best. So, what do you think folklore? To think about your own definition, we can come back to it or just save it for the end of this talk to see if or how it changes. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. So, what is folklore? 
And what is folklore in 25 minutes or less? <laughs> is it the stories your nan told you? Is it myths and fairy tales and folk tales? Is it old wives tales or tall tales? Is it drinking from the opposite side of the cup to cure hiccups? Is it beliefs that are untrue? Certainly folklore may be some of these things, but it is so much more. In fact, folklore is all around us and we all have it from the jokes and stories we share to picking up a lucky penny or a lucky dime to preparing and sharing Sunday dinner, including what you call it, jigs dinner, boil dinner, cook dinner, to the graffiti in the munnels, to the skills and techniques of hunting and fishing. One of the first steps to understand folklore is to be able to identify folklore. You may say it's a lullaby, but how is a lullaby folklore? It's about transmission and variation. For example, the song Rockabye Baby. I imagine you all know it. Rockabye baby on the treetop when the wind blows the cradle will rock. When the bell breaks the cradle will fall and down will come baby cradle and all. <laughs> It's um, really pretty disturbing lyrics if we break them down, but in any case, it's a well-known lullaby, but it's not folklore on its own. So let's imagine that your mother learned it from her mother and then sang it to you at bedtime when you were young. You heard it so much that you learned it yourself and knew all the words. You sang it to your dolls siblings, cousins, the kids you babysat. This makes it a traditional song. It doesn't have to be passed from parent to child every time. It doesn't matter who it's passed along to. The kids you babysat may pass it along to their friends, but if it's passed along and continues to be sung, then it's traditional and it's folklore. Folklore transmission happens over space and time. When folklore is passed along over generations, we think of it as being passed along over time. When it is passed along through various friend or school groups, skipping rope rhymes or hand clapping games, for example, it is passed along through space. So how many of you know the clapping rhyme, Miss Mary Mack? So um, Janet, do you know this one? Miss Mary Mack, 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 all dressed in black, black, black with silver buttons, buttons, buttons all down her back, back, back. So um, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> um, so when I teach introduction to folklore, I'll ask the students if they know the song and the clapping gestures that go along with it. And I'd say at least two thirds of the students know it. And then I ask where they are from. And they might be from different parts of this province. They might be from different parts of Canada or the US or even other parts of the world. They also range in age. So how is it that we all know the same song? It's a great example of folklore transmission because it is passed along informally through time and space. We didn't learn it in school, but somehow many of us know it and share it when we shared it when we were school age children. We don't learn it from teachers or parents, but rather it's passed along through friend groups. Transmission is how it's passed along and variation is how it changes slightly each time it's sung. It could be the words or even the tempo or the hand clapping gestures. Each time a person learns and then sings for herself, there are slight variations. That's folklore. Folklore is traditional expressive culture. Traditional culture is what is passed along. This may be through friend groups, siblings and families, sports teams, workplaces, school or craft communities. We pass things along that are important to us. 
Each time it's passed along, it changes a little as it moves from person to person and group to group. Another helpful way to consider folklore is to imagine it as part of a cultural continuum. In this way, we may think about folk, popular, and elite cultures. Folk or traditional culture is passed along by word of mouth, imitation, or observation. This could be the lullabies or schoolyard games or a family recipe. Popular culture is passed along through mass media like television, radio, internet, or magazines. There is a known source and it reaches many people. I like to give the example of Rachel's haircut from the TV show Friends. You may have seen it. When the show aired in the 1990s, someone could walk into a hair salon and ask for the Rachel. Her haircut was so iconic. Hairdressers would know what the customer was talking about. That wouldn't be the case today, but it was passed along and known in its day. And finally, elite or academic knowledge is culture that is learned through formal institutions such as religious institutions, church, synagogue, mosque, schools, museums, or music conservatories with little or no variation. For example, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony does not change even though different orchestras play it. We learn through all three of these cultural processes. They are overlapping, intermingling, and exchanging influences. For example, popular and even some classical music are rooted in traditional music. We're not trying to create definitive boundaries here, but rather thinking about how these processes, um, thinking about these processes helps to understand the transmission of folklore. So as Memorial Folklore grad, Dr. Lynn McNeil explains in her book, Folklore Rules, she says, it's not so much the form, <clears throat> but the way the form is transmitted within the population. So now there is an understanding about transmission and variation. Let's move on to some topics and themes that folklorists explore. Historically, folklorists were collectors like Halpert and Widdowson, they were interested in collecting various genres of traditional culture. For example, folk songs or folk tales or jokes or proverbs. Collectors were interested in texts themselves. They were less interested in the context that surrounded the text. Over the years, that has changed. And now I think it's safe to say that context is everything. So something else I might tell in introductory folklore class, I might say a quilt is never just a quilt. We might ask, who made it? How did the maker learn to quilt? How was the quilt used in your home? What materials were used to make the quilt? Does the tradition have different styles or variations? What are they? Describe the steps of the process from start to finish. What's involved? What does the quilt mean to you? When I begin a class with these questions, inevitably we'll learn about the quilt Nan made using her late husband's old ties or the quilt that mom made using all the old pajamas of her children or the t-shirts, or, 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 the list goes on. So there are many ways to look at the quilt. In fact, the quilt doesn't have to be handmade to be folklore either. Remember transmission. How might the quilt, store-bought or handmade, how might that quilt have value to the owner? How is the quilt meaningful? So even though one folklorist might be interested specifically in the skills and techniques of the quilter, 
Another folklorist might examine a group of women who quilt together and the stories they tell while quilting. Someone else might be interested in family narratives, perhaps the way the quilt was passed along within a family, given as a wedding gift or a graduation gift. I should stop here and say that not all folklore is about quilts or crafts or stories and oral narratives. Folklorists also study belief and customs and the food ways of various groups. Again, folklore is so many things and not easy to define. I love the essay definition by folklorist Mary Hufford. I'll read you an excerpt. She says, folk life is the secret languages of children, the code names of CB operators and the working slang of watermen and doctors. It is the shaping of everyday experiences in stories swapped around kitchen tables or parables read from pulpits. It is the variety of ways there are to skin a muskrat, preserve string beans, or join two pieces of wood. Folk life is scrawled on urban streetscapes by graffiti artists and projected onto skylines by tapering steeples of churches, mosques, and temples. Folk life is community life and values, artfully expressed in myriad forms and interactions. Through folklore study, we examine ordinary life in order to understand the values and perspectives of people and groups. By examining folklore, we open a window into people's lives and often reflect a mirror back onto our own. My personal approach to folklore that I practice and teach is that first and foremost, we need to have a sense of where we come from about the folklore in our own lives over time. There is a wonderful poem called Where I'm From by George Ella Lyons. It goes like this. I am from clothes pins, from Clorox and carbon tetrachloride. I am from the dirt under the back porch, black, glistening, it tasted like beets. I am from the forsythia bush, the Dutch elm whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own. I am from fudge and eyeglasses, from Imogene and Alifair. I'm from the know-it-alls and the pass-it-ons, from perk up and pipe down. I'm from he restores my soul with cotton ball lamb and 10 verses I can say myself. I'm from Artemis and Billy's branch, fried corn and strong coffee from the finger my grandfather lost to the auger, the eye my father shut to keep his sight. Under my bed was a dress box spilling old pictures, a sift of lost faces to drift beneath my dreams. I am from those moments snapped before I budded, leaf fall from the family tree. In this poem, we see so many elements of folklore the material culture, clothes pins, the dress box, old pictures, the landscape for Scythia bush and the Dutch elm, food ways, fried corn, fudge and strong coffee, family stories, the finger the grandfather lost to the auger, the eye her father shut to keep his sight. We even get a sense of the family's religious beliefs. I'm from he restoreth my soul with cotton ball lamb and 10 verses I can say myself. This would be a Christian family that values Bible study. We also get a window into the everyday language that seals her family as a folk group. The know-it-alls, the passadons are perk up and pipe down. This is language shared by a family. So maybe now, after this talk, you might take a moment and think about the folklore in your lives. When I teach this poem in introductory folklore classes, I have the students write their own version of the poem, and it's always a wonderful project. So I asked you to write a definition or to think about one, 
where is the folklore in your lives, the inside jokes you share with friends and family, special meals, the way you set a table or how you prepare peas pudding or a holiday turkey or brisket. Do you make soup? Do you make pea soup on Saturdays with doughboys? Do you knit, go berry picking? Do you hunt or fish? Have you told or heard stories about fairies? Do you know about the polar bear in the rock? Would you follow the adage, red skies at night, sailors delight? Do you eat your fish and chips with dressing and gravy? What about pineapple crush? Do you decorate your house for Halloween and other holidays? Have you ever put or received an orange in your Christmas stocking? Do you tell the story of your first date or the time you got lost in the woods or that time your heart got broken? This is all folklore. On a final note, I want to highlight that now more than ever, folklore is vital to the academy as well as to society as a whole. Through the study of traditional expressive culture, we learn about the customs and practices that are meaningful among groups we are part of and groups that we are not a part of. When folklorists study belief, for example, we don't question how or why people believe what they do, but rather we listen and try to understand how belief shapes family or group values. Thinking about our own groups, we are never fully inside or outside our group, but rather we are part of many groups. And at different times, we may be insiders or outsiders to groups we know well and groups we know little about. Folklore fieldwork, paying attention, asking questions, being curious, listening, helps us to understand how we create group identities. The stories we tell about ourselves to ourselves, as well as the stories we tell about ourselves in order to let others know who we are or who we want to be. And although folklore is often celebratory, it also provides a platform for more troublesome beliefs, such as stereotyping and prejudice, the stories we tell ourselves about others. We talk about and celebrate heritage, but the concept of heritage is loaded. At a recent online lecture I attended, folklorist Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet discussed the other side of heritage or national pride, which can be linked to legacies of shame. Not the note I want to end on, but I don't want to leave it unsaid either. As the folklore department moves forward into the next 50 years, we are looking at the gaps and working towards a more equitable discipline and department. Studying folklore is studying people with all the joy and creativity and curiosity and studying people can and troublesome, but we cast a wide net and what we see to find patterns, to treat people with respect, to listen. Folklore is underscored by complex issues, but studying folklore can help increase tolerance and cultural understanding. I hope it doesn't seem trite to say this, but I believe that if everyone took a folklore course, it would help people see the world a little bit differently, to see and engage with the beauty and creativity of everyday life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jillian. That was fantastic. So interesting. We've had some really interesting comments here. Um, I'm just going to get, I'm just going to get rid of the presentation and uh, Jillian and I are going to pop our own heads up here so we can talk and answer questions. Oh, Chris Hendry says thundering applause, Jillian, thundering applause. So let me just, just bear with me for a second. I don't want to say that. Nope. Just bear with me, everybody. Nope. Nope. We want to have our faces up and then we're going to, okay, there we go. 
Okay, and I'm gonna change this so, to me so I can see both of us together. Wonderful, okay. So um, uh, please, if you have questions, specific questions for Dr. Gould uh, about folklore, about folklore research, in general about it here in Newfoundland, uh, please don't hesitate to pop that in the chat or in the in the Q&A. Now, I do have some questions now. I've just clicked on the Q&A uh, from. Um, uh, OK, John Ennis is asking what differentiates folklore from tradition? Um, he's thinking of traditions to your question. What is folklore? Or what is your but but are traditions folklore? Yeah, so I, I, that's a great question. And I think they're so connected that yes, I think traditions are folklore. So I think of traditions as what we're passing along and the way that I, we consider them traditions through a folklore perspective is that they are not unchanging, but that they are always changing. They're passed along and changing. And that's what makes it folklore. And so we think about the traditions that are important enough to us that we continue to do. And that's, I, I would call that folklore because it's also part of that idea of transmission and variation. So they're very connected. So yes, traditions and folklore are really one and the same. I think you can't talk about one without the other. Uh, we have a comment from Rebecca O'Keefe. She's thanking you very much for this presentation. Uh, she says, we own an outdoor adventure company, uh, in Wild Gross Morn, and a shop, the Bond Bay Market in Gross Morn, as an outdoor cultural interpretive guide and being responsible for the professional development of other guides. Folklore is incredibly important to them. Uh, to me, folklore encompasses so many things. It includes our traditions, stories, values, and essentially the culture of our province that is passed along orally. She says we share this every day with our guests. She goes on to say, although the scenery on a boat tour or the food at a culinary tour may be wonderful, the related stories we share is often the highlight for many visitors. We are lifelong learners and always looking for new things to share. So she she thanks she thanks you again for that. I'm just going to go pop, pop back into the chat and just say, um, oh, here's a question here from Joseph Lafitte, who says he loved your presentation. Are there any plans to digitize archive analog and paper media found in Munfla to make them more accessible and available? Yeah, I, I, I think they are, they are digitizing. It's a, it's a small a staff. <laughs> And um, I don't know enough about it, but uh, but I do know they are they are they are digitizing, um, and I think a lot of things are also between Munfla and the DAI, the Digital Archives Initiative. I think they're going in in both places, um, but I'm sorry I can't answer that um, as much as I would like to. Right. We could get an update. Maybe we could. I could reach out to Munfla and find out from them where that where they are and what is digitized and what isn't and what they're working on. Maybe get a little update and we could include that in the in the follow up message to everybody. Yeah, um, I'm just going to take a look at those 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 questions about the thoughts on folklore in your lives. Um, Chris Hendry says that folklore is much broader than he realized. Uh, Jamie Gillingham says, per perhaps folklore is more assumed than intentionally transmitted. Mm. That's interesting. I love that idea because I think I think it can be both, and I it's actually a, something I I think about a lot. Sometimes we're very deliberate about the things that are meaningful. It sometimes that happens with our family folklore. We choose something that we want to pass along, something that was special to us. But sometimes I think it's it's we don't even realize we're doing things. And and I think those are very interesting moments too. those sort of ordinary everyday things that we do. And, and we don't realize that it really informs and shapes us. And I think that's, you know, so there's that deliberate and then um, the, the things that we don't realize we're doing. Uh Gail Cullen has just posted and said, thank you so much for helping me understand the true meaning of folklore, which is lovely. Julia Pomeray says to her that folklore to her often has to do with people's connections to things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
and I'm just going to see here. Anne Marie Bush uh, She says that sorry. Her, her definition of folklore would be stories, skills, or knowledge passed on verbally or visually, not necessarily written down or recorded as a hard copy. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, just uh, looking. And Jillian, can you tell me, I'm curious, how did you first get kind of, how did the folklore bug first bite you? Because your your first degree was in, Jewish literature and culture. So I guess that's folklore in a way, isn't it? And then, yeah. guess, yes. Can you explain that a little bit? How that, how you came to folklore from, from, from that? Yeah, sure. I think it's again, one of these, you know, where you're sort of going along and, and doing it, but not realizing there's a name for it. So I think I was always interested in, um, customs and traditions and um, the way that groups and cultures make meaning, holidays and family. And, and I actually came across a, an article by this, uh, a folklorist and it was, she was looking at um, cookbooks, Jewish cookbooks in a historical perspective. And I was an undergrad and I thought that it was a, his, the work of a historian, but in fact, it was the work of a folklorist. And that sort of set me on, on my path. Um, that was the first article. And then the other, so I, there, I guess there are sort of the personal ways, just the things I've been interested in, the way I've always loved to talk to people and hear their stories and try to make, make sense of who they are and thinking about, you know, what, what I'm all about. And, um, and then in the academic there, you know, there's the, it was sort of between folklore and anthropology. And the more I sort of studied and had my eyes open, I realized what folklore was. Um, so I, before I came to folklore, I had a, I, a background in, in museum education. That's what I had gone into. Mm -hmm. And in that work, I was meeting folklorists and said, hey, that's that's what I want to do. <laughs> so, and that's why Memorial is, you know, such a wonderful place and program. And I can say that as coming, you know, from the student perspective, as well as coming back years later to be on, on the faculty. So we're, we're very lucky to have the department here. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of international students come through the folklore department, haven't we? Yes, yes, yes. yeah. Uh, I've got a couple of questions here now. Uh, uh, what are the under what undergrad? What are the degree programs? Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. What are the undergraduate degree programs that allow for research in folklore in, at the graduate level? Oh, okay, that's a great question. So, um, really, because there are so few folklore programs. There are no prerequisites to come into the uh, graduate program at the master's or PhD level. Um, at the PhD level, sometimes people are coming in with a master's in folklore, but even that it's not always the case. So any program, um, you know, it, it's really more about what your interests are and do they fit in with uh, what folklore is about. Um, and I see that, Graciela, if you want to chat with me after, get in touch with me, I'm happy to talk with you about, um, about the program. And um, yeah, I do see that, the, the job and career. Absolutely. I mean, I, I really do think folklore is one of those, um, one of the disciplines that has a real practical side to it because you're learning everything, you know, how to, how to work in a, how to work in a group, how to talk to people, how to um, be culturally sensitive and aware, how to listen. And I think that these skills, I mean, I write recommendation letters, you know, quite often for undergrads, but they're not always going into folklore programs. They're going into nursing or um, speech pathology. And, and I'm always writing these letters and saying, yeah, folklore, you need a folklorist. They, you know, they've got the skills that you're looking for. So we don't have uh, to look further than than the national CBC radio to see Tom Power and the amazing job he does every day on Q. And he has a folklore degree from Memorial. 
folklore yeah. music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of comments here. Uh, uh, in the oral tradition, I have heard of Newfoundland and Labrador trappers spending days on the trails. Some could not read or write, but produce songs and stories in their heads by repeating lines over and over until they had it by rote. When they arrived home, they sang new songs and told new stories. Mm, I love that. I ha I haven't heard that, but that's that's wonderful. That's yeah. lovely. Uh, Maxine is saying, "What a delightful way to revisit stories and traditions of our beautiful province." Thank you. Uh, let me just pop into. Um, uh, we've got another question here from Eileen Murphy. I like the idea of being in the moment or context as a, oh, it's a, it's a comment. As a traditional crafts person, I have found the lore of my craft is the soul and heart of each piece. Mm, that's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, so great. Gosh, this is really an interesting conversation. I'm just sit, having a quick look to see if there's any more questions. No more actual questions, questions. Here's a comment uh, from Terry Coles. I think a lot about internet folklore from how memes travel and change to the conventions of online communities. Uh, an in joke from a group of friends I met online made it into the book acknowledgements for one of them, for example. So that's really interesting, Terry. Yes, I love yeah. that. How things change and it. You know, somebody can say sort of a throwaway line and then it becomes an inside joke, you know, between friends or a family and that becomes folklore. So I think that those are those moments that, um, you, you know, it what you sort of take with you. And that's this sort of rethinking about what tradition is that it doesn't have to be, you know, necessarily the, you know, the songs and the folk tales, but just these, you know, funny lines or jokes or, you know, that's it's it's what we share and how we're connecting to each other. Absolutely. Well, I think that now, oh, here's a question. Uh, because I was going to say, I know Jillian is really busy because she told me at the beginning of this to remind her never to say that she would do something again the week of final exams. <laughs> well, wait, here's a question. Here's a question from Chris Hendry. With more exposure to global media, what impact is this having on folklore research in, gen in general? I think that's that's a great question, and I uh, and. I don't, I don't know, but what I do think is that what we understand as folklore is sort of, I feel like it's, it's out there more that more people are doing folklore the same way that I said, I, I call, I didn't, I was doing it, but I didn't know there was a name for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, just thinking about all of these podcasts, we're listening to interviews, we're really trying to understand people through their stories and mm -hmm. And I think that it's, it, it is, um, I think it's impacting the research we do, but I think it's also impacting sort of, it's, it's, it's coming into academia, but it's also taking us outside. So it's, I don't know if that really makes sense, but I think it's sort of in the air right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Imagine the folklore coming out of the pandemic. Oh my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, wow. How things have, yes, have shifted, how, um, well, I, I've just taught this course on food ways and one paper a student was writing about um, COVID birthday parties and, you know, what changes, how have holidays changed, these calendar customs, the different ways that we gather our groups. So um, that's, you know, something that's happening daily. Absolutely. Okay, I'm just going to pop up our sort of end slide just to remind everybody that we do have one more event in our uh, HSS 101 series coming up on May the 25th. That's going to be religious studies with Dr. Patricia Dold, a not to be missed event. Uh, but I would like to thank Dr. Gould for her presentation and for taking the time during this very, very busy time to join us today. And I'm sure everyone has learned a lot about folklore and its role in all of our lives. Um, thank you to all of you out there uh, for attending and for your great questions and comments. If you enjoyed today's event, remember our fourth HSS session will be held on May 25th with Dr. Patricia Dole discussing religious studies. If you'd like to register for that, 
go to www.mun.ca slash alumni to the events page and, and you can pop on there to register. Um, and as I indicated earlier, this event has been recorded and I will be sharing a link in a follow up email. So please keep your eyes on your inbox. And I think that's it. So thanks again to Jillian and thanks to everyone out there. And uh, we'll say goodbye now. And um, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. That was great. Thank you.